Hey everybody, I'm Brent. And I'm Bo. And this is Rough and Tumble Joy. It's Wednesday and we're really glad that you are with us as we continue working our way through the third chapter of the book of Philippians. Uh, yesterday we talked about the righteousness that comes only through the grace of Jesus Christ and not anything we can do to obtain it. And Paul understood that in spite of all of his deep Jewish history and all the things he had done to be good in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of other people, none of it mattered. The only thing that mattered was Jesus Christ. Uh, and today he picks up and he's going to continue uh, what this has meant in the attitude shift of his heart. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's a powerful way to, to understand if, if that's not going to benefit us, looking at all of our past accomplishments, then what do we focus on? What is our goal? What should we strive for? What should we look toward? Um, so uh, in my Bible in verse 10, it says, uh, well, we'll continue back a little bit. It says, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now in verse 12, this is where he shows us, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, do not consider that I have made it, on, it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah, so this goes back to this thing we talked about in chapter 2 about working out your salvation with fear and trembling. We're, gonna, sure. we're hearing some more of some vocabulary about what it looks like for us to grow in our faith, to kind of fulfill our salvation. And also in this, in this case, he turns it to the power of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Same thing, the power of salvation, the power of the resurrection. It's the same power, that power of God that's working in the middle of us. And I just, I love how this whole thing begins. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. And uh, it, we're just coming off of Easter. This is fresh on our minds, this idea that there is power uh, that God wants to give us into our lives. The power of the resurrection is not just the power that raised Jesus from the dead, but it is the power that's working in us. Mm -hmm. And Paul says, man, I want that power to be a constant part of my life. Yeah, and it's a power that doesn't just come with uh, with ease. It's a power that you have to depend on him. You even have to, and Paul realizes this, he says, share in his sufferings. Mm -hmm. That we have to go through this knowing that this world does not want that way of life. And for us to choose the way, the truth, and the life, mm -hmm. it will cause us friction. And it will cause tension in our lives with other people, um, people we love, people we don't like. And because of this, part of retaining the resurrection, part of... This idea of, of being with Jesus in uh, one day includes going through this world today. Right, and just like Jesus had difficulty in this life, yeah. uh, just as he had persecution in this life, we shouldn't be surprised when we come into patches like that as well. Not everybody's going to love us if we're believers. Mm -hmm. uh, there are going to be people who are going to stand against us, and there's things we're going to have to suffer in this life just because we're followers of Christ. Right, and so if you're going through a hard time, if you feel like you're suffering right now, but you could put it in this perspective that you're suffering with Christ, that he went through suffering. But sometimes it's it's hard to hear that. It's hard to just say, oh, well, it's all going to work out. And so Paul gives you a very specific way to focus, even in the day-to-day, -day, not just focused on the end times, not just focused on that last day you're with him, but things you can focus on today through your suffering. Yeah, and the kind of suffering that we endure, I mean, it comes from lots of different sources. Right. Sometimes the suffering is because we're persecuted by people that are not believers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we go through suffering because we have a ministry to do in the midst of our suffering. Like the pain comes into our life and God is using it to accomplish good things. I mean, right. think about this. Jesus, and this is a deep and kind of a hard truth, but Jesus goes through suffering on purpose and his suffering was necessary for your salvation and mine. And is it possible that sometimes God will allow us to go through suffering because there's somebody else that he wants to bless, somebody else he wants to help, and our suffering is an instrument that he's using to bring about good things in their life, to help them to grow, to help bring them to Christ? This ministry of suffering is, I think, a ministry that every believer has at one time or another in their life. It's a ministry that Jesus had. And obviously, Paul knew a lot about the ministry of suffering. Yeah, He'd had a lot of it in his life. And um, when you do suffer, it then gives you the opportunity to, sh to connect with someone who's in that same spot. I've always heard the best way to share the gospel is through someone's pain or through their passion. Mm -hmm. And so if you've struggled with something and you've worked through suffering, now you can connect with someone who's going through the same thing. It, it, it's, it's, there's nothing like talking to someone who's been in your shoes and who knows what you're going through 
and then can connect with you on that deep emotional and just human nature level. And there is a power of God that you just can't know in good times, Mm -hmm. right? There is a power of God that only comes to us when we're suffering and things are difficult. And none of us would choose suffering, but when suffering comes and we can rejoice in it like Paul does because we recognize that the power of the resurrection is present, the power of the resurrection comes to our aid, the power of the resurrection carries us forward uh, in the same way that it carried Jesus. And so he says, I want to share in the sufferings with Jesus. I want to share in his death. Yet in verse 12, he continues by saying that he has not obtained uh, the resurrection from the dead. He has not attained this perfect relationship with Jesus yet. Uh, He says, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. And uh, just this idea here that Paul is still, he's straining. I don't know, give me your take on this, that he is... He's using such strong language that he is working at this. He makes it his on his his goal. He presses on. He endures uh, through this endeavor. I mean, maturity. Um, uh, there, there's this old kind of idea: you should mature and endure. And so he's doing that because he knows he's Jesus's. Well, this is another one of these gritty, tenacious passages yeah. from Paul, who just says, "Look, making progress as a Christian is is not easy." Right. Like it takes a lot of energy, right? Mm-hmm. Our sense of heaven and that heaven is ours after it's over with is is given by the grace of God. It's a gift, right? But the transformation of our character, right? And the work that we have to do as a love act toward God, that is hard. Uh, and it takes a lot of energy. It doesn't earn us heaven, uh, but it does bring about a transformation of our character and it leads us toward this perfection that Paul wants. He doesn't want perfection because that perfection is going to get him into heaven. Mm-hmm. He wants perfection because he wants to honor God and he loves God and he wants to thank God for the salvation that he knows and he wants to demonstrate his love by allowing his life to be transformed. Right. Right. Uh, so this is, a, this is a thing that's going on. So he presses on uh, toward this goal and then we get back again toward this uh, athletic metaphor that is so common in Paul's writings. Uh, he says, I haven't achieved it yet, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and look forward, looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to the, reach the end of the race. Here's that athletic metaphor again. And reach the heavenly prize for which God through Christ uh, is calling us. Yeah. Uh, so James says this again. We talked a little bit about this yesterday, but James compares this idea of you've got to go to the ultimate reward and uh, this prize. And so there, there might be hardship along the way. Uh, this this prize here, by the way, it could be one of two things he's representing. It could be the race again. Mm-hmm. It also could be archery, that he's shooting for this thing, and he, mm. he's trying to get there, and he's trying to make this point, and he's trying to make this, this goal in mind. And so he will continue moving forward. He will continue pressing on. He will continue going through whatever God has in store for him so that one day he will get there, and that prize will be his. And the prize really is not just heaven, the prize is Jesus. Like the mm. prize is being with Jesus. It's not being in heaven. It's actually the one who calls you his own. Now you are with him and you never have to be away from him again. Yeah, and I, I think that the prize goes back to the other things that are connected to reward. Yeah. For what this is worth. I think that I think that and the reward for believers is this moment of receiving a well done, my good and faithful servant. Sure. Right at the throne, and this is the prize that we're aiming toward. I've been thinking. We're. Uh, I know a lot of you who visit uh, or watching us on uh, on the mornings, uh, right? Don't have kids, but we're in the middle of working on a new series for our children. And one of the ideas I've been thinking a lot about is that as parents, one of the goals that we have for our kids. I mean, one of the main drivers that should motivate parents and grandparents too is that we want to see our kids one day stand before the throne of God and for God to say to our children, well done, my good and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. And everything we do as parents is trying to move them toward that end. As a pastor, I know this is my heart for our church family. I want to see everyone that's a member of our church one day stand before God and God say to them, well done, my good and faithful servant. You did great in this life. You pursued the goal. You crossed the finish line. You ran your race well. Now, we know that that's not true for everybody who's a believer. Right. Right. There's people who would say that they're believers in Christ, but they don't seem to want to run. They sit down beside the track and they never take steps. Uh, God's grace covers them. Um, you know, the Bible talks about them finding heaven by, you know, just the skin of their teeth, right? Sure, yeah. Kind of a metaphor, but that's not what Paul wants to do. He doesn't want to be the kind of person that just barely slides into heaven. He wants to be a person who at the end of it all, he hears Jesus say, well done, my good and faithful servant, right? At yeah, I end. love it. I mean, um, he, he is someone who doesn't preach fire insurance, right? He's one that preaches faith and obedience every day 
through the fire of this world, knowing that um, what's on the other side is so much greater. Yeah, I want I want my heavenly Father to celebrate the end of my life because I ran well, yeah, or shot well, yeah, uh, as the as, one you prefer. as the case may be. <laughs> well, tomorrow we're going to pick up and continue as he continues in this theme. I'm glad you've been here today. Have a wonderful day. We'll talk to you tomorrow. See you.